Welcome everybody to the Maine Wildlife Park, uh, Where Wildlife Go in Winter Talk. We're gonna be getting started in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we're gonna talk about all different types of wildlife in Maine and what they do for winter. And we are featuring right now our links that are down at the Maine Wildlife Park. So we'll use that share screen while we wait and so you can watch the links. So you guys, while we're waiting here, you can see the links is right up front in the window. And then the other one is um, behind up climbing on the rocks. All right, we're going to be getting started now. I'd like to introduce you all to Jay, who is down at the Maine Wildlife Park. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jade. I'm an educator for the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife here in Maine. And we're at the Maine Wildlife Park in Gray, Maine. Um, here we have many different species of native Maine wildlife. Um, and they're all here for a number of different reasons. Um, all of them cannot live in the wild on their own. And that can be because they're orphaned or injured or were rehabilitated or for some reason um, are just human dependent. So um, today we're gonna be talking about uh, what animals do in the winter and some of our winter adaptations. So when the seasons change here in the Northeast, we all get ready for some changing weather. Each season we do different activities, we wear different clothes, and even eat some different foods. And this is because there are different types of weather, different fresh foods available, and um, different activities that we can do. And wildlife go through the same changes, just a little bit differently than we do. Um, so let's think about summer first. You get ready by finding your t-shirts, your shorts, your sandals, maybe bathing suits. Um, we don't wear so many layers because if we had all those layers on, we'd be way too hot in the sun. We might eat things like fresh veggies and strawberry, like strawberries and fruits um, that you'll get at local farms and things like that, um, that grow seasonally. And we're doing things like canoeing and swimming and hiking um, less than we're gonna be doing things like snowshoeing or snowmobiling. Um, as the weather changes, our bodies are triggered by shorter days, longer days, um, the different temperature, and animals notice these changes too. In the winter, we do the opposite of summer. What are some things that you do differently in the winter than in the summer? These are some things that we might be actually doing right now as we're going through fall and winter is coming. And we're not just talking about adding pumpkin spice to your food. We do a lot of different things. Um, one example is layering up. So I have on my jacket, I have my gloves here with me. Um, I have a vest and a shirt and double pants and warm socks on. Um, gotta add those layers on as it gets colder. I eat some more yummy foods, like warm foods, like soups and chilies. We eat some more um, calorie and fattening, like foods like cookies and cakes and things like that. And that is um, us preparing for winter. And that is us responding to seasonal changes. And wildlife is doing this too. So you can see um, our links that have been moving around here behind me. They are growing in some very thick winter coats. Um, in the spring, they shed a lot of that hair off. And in the summer, they have some lighter coats. But right now um, is the prime time 
for them to be growing in their extra thick winter coats. So as we see them, um, especially if they get closer, you can see how fluffy they are right now. So as the amount of sunlight each day uh, increases at the end of summer, um, sorry, decreases at the end of the summer, animals begin to prepare for winter. And that often means hiding their food for colder months or eating large amounts of food to fuel their migration, to keep them warm as they stay active for the winter, um, or to provide enough energy to hibernate. Each one of these different things, migrating, um, being active during the winter and hibernating um, are all adaptations or a way that helps animals survive in the winter in the Northeast. And this is when there's not as much wild food available. Um, the weather changes, it gets colder, icier, snowier. So we're gonna take a look at different wildlife and how they deal with winter. Migration is one way that animals um, survive the changing seasons. And migration is more than just a short trip across town. Uh, migration can sometimes be hundreds or even thousands of miles traveled in just a few days or a few weeks. And migration is a part of this annual cycle for some of Maine um, wildlife when they leave in the fall and winter um, and then they return in the spring and summer. Um, and it's just one survival strategy so that they can have enough food and resources to survive until their next um, breeding or mating seasons. Can you think of some animals in Maine that migrate? One of the first animals that most of us think about are birds. And that is because they're easy to see. They're so great at flying. Here I have a great horned owl. And we can kind of see on this uh, owl what makes it um, adapted for moving. Of course, flight is going to be um, something that animals can use to move over great distances in a pretty short amount of time. So even though the great horned owls do not migrate, um, they still have those adaptations that birds have to help move around. And they're going to do this because they're in search of easier access to food, like insects, uh, small prey and plants. Um, and they, the migratory birds, choose to spend their energy traveling um, to stay in warmer seasons where they have lots of bountiful food sources instead of using their energy um, to stay warm in cold climates. So we do have some birds um, here in Maine, like our state bird, the black cap chickadee that you can see on the top there. We also have our bald eagles over on the side and the woodpecker that's on the bottom. And they um, stay here throughout the winter. They choose to use their energy to stay warm and try and forage for food throughout the cold months. But then we have the other animals that are gonna be migrating. So animals like hummingbirds, osprey, and herons. Um, as the daylight shortens, the flowers are drying up, their babies have grown. This is when they are gonna start heading south. And it takes a lot of energy to fly hundreds and thousands of miles to their wintering grounds. When they get there, the food is much easier to find and it's warmer, so they don't need to spend um, energy trying to stay warm. They'll migrate to places like Florida, the Caribbean, um, South America, but then they'll also make the return trip back in the spring to raise their young. We have a map here that you can actually um, see the path of a great blue heron that um, recently traveled south from Maine. She was tracked as part of a inland fisheries and wildlife project to learn more about uh, Maine's herons. And she flew for about three days from Canada to Georgia over the ocean, then kept going further and further south. So pretty incredible um, how far this single bird went um, for her migration. We have some other birds that Maine is actually their southern point for them. Um, they, might mi they migrate down to Maine from further north and they spend their winters here. Um, they breed up in the Arctic and come here in the winter. So some of those are snowy owls 
the snow bunting, and the purple sandpiper. And over 50% of their population comes to Maine's shorelines for the winter. So really important um, site for them here in our state um, for their survival and for their migration. Some other flying animals that migrate that are not birds are bats and insects. So insects like butterflies and dragonflies migrate too. And again, flight makes it possible for all these different animals to migrate such long distances so quickly. I have here a bat. This one is inside, I'll try to get it so the glare is not on there, inside a resin. So you can see how this bat, even though it's a mammal, it is adapted for flying. It is the only mammal that can truly fly in Maine. And they eat lots of flying insects. In the winter, it's too cold um, for those flying insects to move around. They rely on the sun's warmth for energy. Um, so in the winter, they, these bats, they either need to hibernate or they need to leave because there's not enough food to keep them alive. So we have three different species of what are called tree bats and they migrate. And we also have five species of bats that hibernate that we'll talk about later. But here you can see the ori bat and a red bat. And the ori bats are believed to migrate the longest distance of any bats. They are not known for living in groups, but during their fall migration, um, it's actually one of the only times when they'll join together and migrate together. And both the males and females will travel together, but they don't stay together after that migration. Um, the females will then make their return flight back pregnant each spring and have their babies in early summer. So you can imagine it takes even more energy to make that migration back with their babies with being pregnant. Must be pretty tough. Another um, survival method is hibernation. And hibernation is what I think most people think of when they think about um, animals changing their behaviors in the change of seasons. And one of the most iconic animals we think of hibernating are bears. Here in Maine, we have black bears. We have somewhere between 24 and 36,000 black bears. And they are not the hibernators that a lot of people think they are. Um, American black bears are not true hibernators. They do become much less active and they don't eat or drink um, once they reach those like really cold and snowy weather. Um, but they don't go into that deep hibernation that is required for us to think of them as true hibernators. Um, and that means they don't reduce their body temperature or their heart rates. Um, instead, they just put on a lot of extra weight by eating a lot of food in the fall and early winter, and they become very um, slow and they sleep a lot. So not true hibernators, but they still uh, do become a lot less active and, and we won't see them as much in the winter. I have a bear fur here that we can look at. Similar to um, the lynx fur I was talking about earlier, they have some really, really, really thick fur and that's gonna help them stay warm when they're in their dens um, over the winter. And during the winter when they are sleeping, the female black bears um, give birth and they have their cubs. And it's inside their dens during the winter when they're hibernating that they have them. Um, here you can see one of our um, biologists holding some bear cubs on a visit to a bear den. Um, so what we do is we collar the females. So they have these radio collars and then we know their location and we can go and um, count how many cubs that that female has had. Um, we can check on the health of the cubs and of the mom and collect important information. Um, for managing our bear populations. And the cubs stay with the mom for over a year. So we can actually see how many cubs have survived their first year because when we go back to that den, those year old cubs are still with the mom. So really important to see how many of those cubs survive through two winters. So let's talk about some true hibernators. To be a true hibernator, the animal not only has to pack on some extra winter weight, and, be, and reduce their activity, but they also lower their heart rate and they'll lower their body temperature a lot too. So these true hibernators will actually sometimes look like 
they're dead, but they are not dead. Um, their heart rate and their body temperature is just a lot lower than when we're being active and moving around. And there are just a few true hibernators in Maine. Um, so they are less active and they're hidden away in dens and burrows with their food, um, but they're not gonna wake up to eat. Um, their body goes into a deep resting state. And our species here are the woodchucks, the jumping meadow mice, and bats. And they're inactive for months at a time in their dens, caves, and burrows from late uh, fall to spring. First, we'll check out the groundhog. So groundhogs are the largest member of the squirrel family and one of Maine's true hibernators. They'll go in and out of a deep hibernation, but almost never truly wake up except in February when it's mating season, but then they'll go right back to bed. So they've been recorded um, to have their body temperatures drop to 41 degrees um, for about a week at a time. So that is a really low body temperature for an extended period of time. And that's one of the reasons that they are true hibernators. Our little brown bats um, don't migrate. They need to hibernate. And they might travel um, short distances to get to a good site, like a small cave or an old building, um, certain rock crevices. But they often gather in groups and in the winter, and this is called their um, hib hibernaculum. And they begin to hibernate at the beginning of October, and then they reemerge at the end of April. And it's very important for bat survival not to disturb bats during their hibernation. So there's this new fungal disease and it's killing millions of bats and um, it is called white nose syndrome. You can see it on the bat that's by itself in that picture. And this white nose syndrome has um, reduced our bat population by more than 90%. So we definitely wanna take care of these bats and let them hibernate and not disturb them during that critical time between October and April. Maine's also home to many different cold-blooded animals. We have turtles, snakes, and different amphibians like frogs and salamanders. And being cold-blooded means they can't warm their bodies on their own. So they need warmth from the sun um, or like a heated rock. So what do they do in the winter? Cold-blooded animals also hibernate. So turtles, we have both water and land turtles here in Maine and they hibernate a little bit differently and survive the winter a little bit differently. The land turtles, like the box turtle that you can see here peeking out from its shell, um, they'll uh, reserve fuel through the winter. Um, they hunker down in the early kind of fall nights under rotting logs and leaves. Um, but as the temperatures drop really low, they'll actually burrow deeper underground until they're below the frost line and then they'll hibernate there. Our aquatic turtles, like the painted turtle, um, they'll actually burrow down in the mucky bottom of the pond before they enter hibernation. And um, though sometimes on like a mild winter day, the painted turtle will slowly kind of move around beneath the surface of the ice. Um, they'll try and get some sunshine, but the painted turtles can get some oxygen through special skin on their butt. So some people say turtles breathe out their butts when they're hibernating, which is kind of silly, but um, it is actually a way that they can get some air. And then we also have some amphibians like salamanders, frogs, and toads. And they'll also enter um, some sort of hibernation. Um, most species will either burrow under the mud in ponds or burrow um, on lakes to keep from freezing like the bullfrog, American toads, spotted salamanders. Um, but there are three different species, um, the wood frog, the spring peeper, and the green tr gray tree frog. Um, they can actually freeze solid and the frost uh, creeps in under um, like their skin and into their bodies and they burrow under a thin layer of dirt and leaves and uh, logs. So pretty crazy um, adaptation that they have but they will actually freeze their bodies. And then as it warms up, they will slowly defrost. So very interesting adaptation. So while some animals are hibernating and some are leaving for the winter, um, there are others that don't do either. 
they will tough it out and they stay active all season long. Can you think of any uh, wildlife here in Maine that are active during the winter? So we already talked about some birds that stay here, but there are also some mammals that have thick fur and stay active, um, searching for food, water, and shelter. Um, and they have a variety of different ways to keep warm and get food. Smaller mammals like squirrels and mice grow thicker fur and fatten up, but they also hide food for when it's harder for them to find um, food. And they'll add leaves and other insulation to their dens or nests to stay warm. Larger predators like fox and coyotes um, will be active hunting, um, listening and smelling, but they also have thick fur coats. Some animals are very good at winter survival and have the adaptations to prove it. We have the ermine and the um, hare, and they change their fur color um, when the seasons change. So you can see here a picture of a hare um, during the winter, they have that white fur. And then in the summer and the spring, they're brown. So they change their fur for um, the change in their environment and their habitat. You can also see on the bottom here, there's a picture of an ermine, and that is an ermine during um, the spring and uh, uh, summer months, the warmer months. And I have here a fur from the same animal, but it's very different. So just like the hair, they completely change the color of their fur when the seasons change. So they go from that nice brown color to this bright white to blend in with the snow. And again, that's triggered by the change um, in the length of day um, that we can notice and wildlife also notice. We also have the lynx here um, and they look very similar to bobcats, um, but they have some much better adaptations for deep snow. Um, the lynx tend to live in areas in Maine where they get a lot more snow than some of the areas that bobcats live. Um, so they have some different adaptations. I have a lynx fur here that we can look at up close. And you can see just how thick this fur is. It is very, very fluffy. You can't even see the skin underneath because it's so thick. So really helps them um, stay warm in the snow. You can also see these really big feet. So super big feet, especially their back feet are really, really long and their front feet are pretty big too. And they actually use their feet to stay on top of ice and snow and they can creep up on their prey. It's a lot like wearing um, snowshoes to get across um, the snow for us or uh, the ice for us. And there's one so walking they, around behind you. Let's see if I can move. <laughs> Maybe he thought that fur I was holding up was another lynx. I don't know if you can still see him because he went kind of behind the trees up in the back. And he just walked up the, the rocky ledge and he's behind the tree from us right now, but maybe he'll pop out the other side real quick. Along with keeping them warm, their fur um, helps them blend in. So you can see as he's moving along the rocks and in the trees, he really blends in with the different um, shadows and everything. And when he's moving, you can see him. But when he sits still or lays down, um, especially in the rocks, you cannot tell what is a rock and what is a lynx because he blends in so well. So not only does that fur keep them nice and warm and insulated, but also really good camouflage. Another uh, set of mammals that we have here in um, the Northeast is the moose and different species of deer. Um, both moose and white-tailed deer have adapted to thriving in the snow. I have antler here. This is a deer antler. Um, so only the males grow these antlers. So the bucks for the deer and the bulls for um, the moose. Try and move so we can still see the lynx moving around. And they have these antlers um, for the breeding and the mating season. Um, they fight e each other and um, use them then. But in the winter, these actually fall off. So they're really heavy and they take a lot of energy to grow. 
Um, and in the winter when they don't need them anymore, they lose their antlers. Um, so they're not carrying around these big, heavy antlers on their head all winter long. It's kind of a waste of energy and resources. And they change their diets too. So um, moose and deer in the uh, winter, they'll eat plants like um, bark and kind of rougher plants. Uh, they usually eat tree buds and uh, little like leafy greens and things like that, the different browse. But once those leaves are gone, they have to start eating things more like the little branches and twigs, um, some of the rougher stuff that's not quite as tasty for them, but it's what they can find in the winter. So they're really good at surviving on um, the less soft, juicy leaves that they get in the summer. And they both have very thick fur coats. Um, the white-tailed deer will actually change colors a little bit um, for the seasons also that you can see um, in our deer population. Uh, we can also look at the moose here. I have a big piece of moose pelt, moose fur. We can see that uh, it's really, really thick. And moose actually have a special adaptation other than just having um, thick hair, their hairs are actually hollow. So they have air inside of the hairs and it traps warm air close to their bodies. So it keeps them extra insulated and warm. And then the warmer months, they'll shed a lot of that hair off, um, but they still have thick fur then. So they really don't like it when it's really hot. They're definitely better adapted for living in colder climates. And there's some animals that um, do other different things to survive in the winter as part of the changing seasons. Um, some animals, they lay their eggs and they die and only the larvae will live. Um, some fish in their spawning season in the fall, um, they'll migrate upstream to lay eggs in different bodies of water. Um, certain species of butterflies and moths um, will hibernate in like the leaf litter and bark as adults. Um, and then their cocoons or um, like caterpillars, they have different life stages for different seasons. Um, some insects will lay eggs and only the eggs survive um, throughout the winter and the adults do not survive. And there are other insects and invertebrates um, that will just take shelter underground under leaves and logs and sort of hibernate. So there are many different kinds of wildlife in Maine and they all have different survival strategies for the winter. Um, you may not be able to see all the animals that are active all winter, um, but try and find their tracks when you're exploring Maine this winter. Um, even though you don't see the animal themselves, you can try and find their prints, their fur and their scat. Um, they're definitely out there and they're definitely being active. So you just have to kind of use your senses and explore around and look for um, something they've left behind instead of the animal themselves sometimes. Kind of like trying to look for the, the lynx right now. Um, are they visible there behind you? They're so good at camouflaging that you can see why you have to look for tracks and things. Let's take a look and see if we can find them. Um, so there's one at the base of the tree down here. It might be just like barely visible kind of down here. He's sitting there um, grooming himself. Oh, I think I can kind of make him out. Yeah. Very well camouflaged or well adapted to survive. Yeah, he's almost the exact same color of that tree right now too. So um, really blends him with the bark a lot. But he's sitting there kind of grooming his coat and I don't see the other one. The other one might have gone into um, her den, but these two are with one male and one female. They are brother and sister. Um, so very neat. Um, we have a guessing game set up to summarize some of the different um, adaptations for winter. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you an animal and I want you to guess if it stays um, out all winter, if it migrates, or if it hibernates. So let's see if you can guess some of the ones that we've already talked about. So if you can remember um, this first animal, do you think that this animal stays, migrates, or hibernates?
I'm not seeing an animal. <laughs> yeah, just a second. I think it might be oh, hibernating. Okay. <laughs> hmm. One second, folks. Oh, I can see him now, or her. Not sure if this groundhog's a boy or a girl. But can you remember if this um, animal stays, migrates, or hibernates? So the groundhogs hibernate. They drop their body temperatures. Um, they're one of Maine's true hibernators. So like I said, their body temperatures can drop down to 40 degrees in the winter. So definitely a hibernator. All right, what's our next animal? Yeah, these animals just don't want to show up today. Just a <laughs> sec. There we go. So the red fox. So we only said this one quickly but they are one of those um, kind of larger predator mammals. Can you remember what they do in the winter? They stay active. So they have the thick fur coats that they grow. Um, they use their senses to find um, smaller prey in the snow. Um, so they stay active all winter long. And this one's a little bit trickier, the last animal that we've already talked about that we can guess are bats. So do bats stay, migrate, or hibernate? I said it's kind of tricky because some of the species migrate and some of them hibernate. So we have a few species in Maine that do um, leave as the seasons get colder and we have some species that hibernate instead. So kind of tricky. Let's try some animals that we have not talked about. The first animal we have here is a barred owl. So do they stay, do they migrate, or do they hibernate? They are one of our bird species that stays. So they are well adapted for still finding um, prey all winter long. Another species, is the dragonfly. We have many different species of dragonflies. And do you think that they stay, migrate, or hibernate? They migrate. So like I said, um, a lot of insects, they need the sun to power them so they can fly around. So without um, having as much warmth and sunlight, they, um, either die or they need to get out of here and find somewhere warmer. Another animal that we have here in Maine are beavers. Do you think that beavers stay, migrate, or hibernate? So beavers stay active. They have a lot of adaptations for staying warm and busy all winter long. They have a nice layer of fat. They have um, fur that stays nice and water resistant and warm um, and they build their um, lodges to stay in with their beaver families so they stay active. We have some different species of snakes here in Maine. Do you think our snakes stay, migrate, or hibernate? Remember they are cold-blooded so they do need the sun and everything to stay warm and stay active. Um, so snakes hibernate. All of our species here in Maine hibernate. They need that sunlight to stay warm and move around. So when it's not as warm, they have to find somewhere uh, to stay over the winter and hibernate. Our next animal is the red squirrel. Do you think that red squirrels stay, migrate, or hibernate? So like other squirrels, they stay active. Um, again, they are gonna store their food so they can go find it when um, there's less food available in the winter, but they're gonna stay active. 
And the last uh, animal for this game is the piping plovers. Do they stay active or migrate or hibernate? So those piping plovers, they migrate. They are one of our migratory birds. So not one of the species that's gonna stay here and tough it out. Um, they need to move around for the change of season. So we've learned about all these different types of animals. Now, what can you do to help animals in the winter? There's a couple of different things that uh, we can try and do to help different animals here in Maine and in other places. Um, one of those things is not raking our leaves until late spring. And you don't mow as much in the late fall. So those fallen leaves and the thicker grass um, help protect hibernating animals and really important habitats and spaces for them um, to start hibernating. Um, not disturbing logs, rocks, and brush in the woods. Um, again, these are important habitats and locations for animals um, to hibernate. So it would be like someone coming along while you're sleeping and flipping your bed over. Um, not very nice. So try and leave those logs and rocks and brush alone in the woods. And you can also learn about more animals that migrate and hibernate um, at mefishwildlife.com. Um, you can learn about that Great Heron Observation Network. Um, which was that map that we showed you with the great heron migration pattern. Um, and another thing you can do is buying rainforest and bird friendly um, coffee, teas, and chocolates. A lot of coffees, teas, and chocolates are grown um, in rainforest habitats and that is where a lot of our migratory birds spend their winters. So just like um, it's important to protect their habitats here, it's also important to protect their habitats there because where they're spending um, part of the year. So thank you all so much for joining us. I know that was a lot of information um, all about Maine's wildlife in the winter. Um, you can look at our website for more virtual tours and for anything, um, for different activities you can do at home. If there are any questions about anything we've talked about, I'd love to answer any questions that have come in. Yeah, so we did get um, one question. And again, if you have questions, use that chat function right there and we'd be happy to answer them. If we don't get to them today, you can always send us um, an email. You can go to mefishwildlife.com to find that uh, a way to contact us and send us an email. But we did get one question here and it is, can you explain what loons do in winter? Because of course, most of our bodies of water are, are freezing. Um, so enough. You want to take that? Or I can take that on. <laughs> yeah, Laura, I know you know a lot more about birds than I do. Um, so you might have more specific loon information than I do. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that one. So hi, everybody. I'm Laura. I'm not at the main wildlife park. <laughs> I'm at my <laughs> office. <laughs> um, but loons are an animal that um, they kind of move around, but they don't fully migrate um, in the winter time. They'll kind of stay on the open waters for a while. Um, they kind of spread out a little bit. They move off of their nesting um, ponds and things. Once they're young or grown up, they kind of move around. Um, some of our loons will go to the coastline for the winter where it's not as frozen. Some will go a little bit further south. You can find them down along the shoreline of Long Island Sound and places like that. So um, they do move. They will kind of migrate. They don't go quite as far south as what we usually think of for migration, like going to Florida and the Caribbean and things like that. Um, but yeah, they'll try to find uh, water that's not frozen. So oceans and maybe like Southern New England as well. Any other questions? Well, Lynx is moving around. He's back up and moving. He might come back over this way. He's kind of just off. Let's see if I can turn it so we can see him over there. Oh, oh yeah, around. we can see him there coming along the edge with his big feet, big fuzzy toes that are good for the snow. Yeah, and as he gets a little bit closer to you, you can see oh, that really, really fluffy coat. Um, for anyone who hasn't been able to visit the park earlier in the spring or the summer, 
Um, and then coming later in the fall or as we're getting into winter here, um, you can see that transition in their fur with your own eyes. Um, obviously working here at the park, we see it. Um, oh, they're both coming over. They're talking to each other over there. Every now and then in the trees um, behind their enclosure, there'll be little birds and chipmunks. Um, and that's a lot of times when you'll see them get excited like this because they can smell and see and hear those little birds and chipmunks. And they're just hoping that they'll uh, come running into their space. If the chipmunk and bird was smart, it would not do that, but it doesn't so always happen. <laughs> so we do have a couple more questions here. Um, there's one about Canada goose. Um, and uh, it was the Canada geese, uh, do they, they don't seem to migrate, but they stay put. And, and that's another one that's a little bit, a little bit uh, different than um, some of what we usually think of what birds doing, either staying put or, or migrating long distances. Um, the, the Canada goose will, will linger around and they'll move around as well, looking for food sources. Um, some Canada geese do go um, south a little bit, but then we also get Canada geese that have been further north um, during the summer, they're kind of coming down to this area. So um, they're a bird that moves around. They don't quite, quite go as far south as we're thinking, but we do get some that kind of linger around looking for fields and places where they can, where they can eat. And those, uh, those lynx really are running. Let's take another look at them if we can. <laughs> it's hard. They kind of split up in different directions now, but I don't know where to stand so you can see. <laughs> I we can keep see one over there forth. off on the side of the, it just oh. went off camera for us. I think he's coming around. There must be something very interesting in that corner because they are both um, really, really interested in whatever's going on over there. I don't see or hear anything, but my senses are not nearly as good as theirs are. So they probably know there's something rustling around in the leaves over there. Birds are a very interesting question, apparently. Somebody also was wondering, while we're watching the lynx, I'll leave us on the lynx so everyone can watch them. But someone wanted to know about insects and birds in the winter time, and I'll, we'll just say a little bit more about them. So some of our insects kind of overwinter underneath leaves and in plants and things, and our, our winter birds and our fall birds who know this will often spend time um, scratching at the leaves and things, especially our sparrows, looking for things like seeds and maybe looking for some little insects underneath um, those leaves as well. Um, but a lot of insects um, will overwinter underneath leaves, inside logs and things. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we say not to rake. Oh, there goes a lynx again. So I hope that helped answer your question about birds and insects. Look at them go. <laughs> I don't know if anyone can notice, but as they're walking, you can really see how big their back feet are, um, how long those legs are to help them really maneuver around deep snow and um, stay on top of that nice deep snow. I might even be able to get a little bit closer here so we can actually see those. Yeah, hold on tight, people. We're going Features. for a trip. Oh, yeah, sorry, we're moving. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if. Oh, yeah, now yeah, we can. So, if really you can see, see those back feet that are really long, their foot itself actually kind of goes. Um, almost like a third of the way kind of up. You can kind of see their heel up the back of their leg. And broad toes and really, really fluffy um, hairs even on the bottom of their feet to keep their feet warm. Their little built-in snowshoes. And we should probably mention, you said they had not been fed yet today. They'll be being fed soon, which is why they're probably a little extra antsy as well, right? They're looking for the chipmunks and they, it's almost feeding time. Yeah, yep. They um, today are getting fed within the next 30, 45 minutes-ish. So they um, definitely kind of know that routine. And that's probably partially why they're starting to get excited is they know it's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. 
Well, there aren't any other um, questions here at this time, but again, you can find us at mefishwildlife.com. Uh, dot com. Send us your questions if you don't get a chance to ask them now, especially if you're sharing this with others later. Please feel free to message us um, and we'd be more than happy to help answer those questions. Yeah, so thank, thank you to everyone again for joining us today. Um, I hope you're able to learn something new about um, migration, hibernation, and some of the animals that stay active here in Maine um, during all of our changing seasons. Um, again, if you have any questions, please let us know and have a wonderful day. Thank you all so much. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And again, please visit mefishwildlife.com for more information about Maine inland fisheries and wildlife, different kinds of activities that you might be able to do at and around your home and also information about the Maine Wildlife Park. Thank you everybody. Um, we hope that you have a wonderful day.